Hello, everyone. I'm Olympia. Thank you for being here with me in this wonderful place called Lights Out Library. And I have a great story to tell you. We will travel through time from antiquity to modern life and around the world from the China Sea and the Indian Ocean to the Baltic, the Mediterranean, and the Caribbean as we learn about the history of piracy. We will also explore the lives of famous pirates and privateers, such as the Barbarossa brothers, Ching Shi and Blackbeard. As always, you do not need to watch the video to follow along. If you wish to, you may close your eyes and forget about any worries as we embark on this adventure together. Also, we just launch a Patreon page for those of you who wish to support this project and get more of it. If you join, you will get various new things, like the possibility to listen to all episodes with background sounds, regular bonus episodes, the first one about the history of glass making and stained glass is already available there. You will be able to download all these audios, and you will also have your say on the choices of topics, advanced releases, and updates on upcoming episodes. We hope to see you there soon, so that we may continue developing Lights Out Library which we enjoy so much. You will find links in the description box and the first comment pinned under the video. If you fall asleep and wish to resume the video later or jump directly to a particular part of the story, timestamps are also listed in the description and pinned in the first comment as well as links to different streaming options like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Amazon Music, which may be better suited for you. But before we begin, take a long, deep, relaxing breath. When you exhale, release the tension in your shoulders and your neck. Release the tension in your facial muscles, too and allow the sound of my voice to guide you through this journey. Before we reach the Barbary Coast, China, or the Caribbean, we're going to start with an overview of piracy in antiquity and the Middle Ages. In antiquity, the very first records we have of piracy date back to the 14th century that is to say, more than 3,000 years ago. That doesn't mean pirates did not exist prior. It seems reasonable to assume that they did, and that they appeared alongside maritime trade routes and a concentration of wealth in ports. But this is the oldest record we have of pirates. In the 14th century BC, ancient Egypt and other regions of the eastern Mediterranean were raided by sea peoples. The sea peoples would have been a sort of confederation of seafaring tribes whose origins remain very mysterious. They could have come from modern Turkey, Greece, or maybe other parts of southern Europe we only know that they suddenly appeared in the Sea of the Mediterranean, that there are records of their attacks on ships or coasts in Egyptian temples. The Eastern Mediterranean was rather populated from early antiquity, and its geography favored piracy. There are several islands like Cyprus and Crete, 
and many more around the Aegean Sea, as well as many ports. Piracy always seems to appear in places with narrow channels, where ship traffic tends to concentrate on predictable routes. The places we will explore tonight, like the Straits of Gibraltar, America, and the Caribbean, will all share this characteristic. In this same region, the eastern Mediterranean during the first millennium BC, there were no dominant states. Instead, there was a collection of peoples who fought for domination over trade and occasionally became pirates themselves. They were the Phoenicians from the Middle East, the Lyrians from the Balkans, and the Tyrrhenians from Italy. For the ancient Greek gods before the beginning of the Greek classical era, some of these people were known as pirates. For early Greeks, it seems that piracy was a perfectly honorable way of making a living, as long as the targets were foreigners. There are even references to piracy in Greek literature, including in the Iliad and the Odyssey by Homer. The abduction of people to be sold into slavery was very common and was generally the main target of piracy. As the Greek civilization evolved and city-states became more organized, more powerful, and began to control the trade routes, acceptance of piracy declined in Greek society. As the Greeks grew in prosperity, they no longer saw themselves as perpetrators, but more often as victims. Rome, during its rise, also had to face pirates in the Mediterranean. In the 3rd century BC, pirates in the Adriatic Sea were a serious threat to Rome. And in the 1st century BC, when the Roman Republic was in a civil war, there was a resurgence of piracy in the eastern Mediterranean. These pirates threatened commerce between Italy and the eastern Mediterranean. However, these pirates were eventually crushed by Roman fleets, and the renowned General Pompey, also known as Pompey the Great, for the remainder of the rule of Rome around the Mediterranean Sea, piracy was very limited, but it soon returned all around Europe. At the end of the Roman Empire and after its fall, multiplied, particularly during the Dark Ages and the Viking Age. The former Roman province of Britannia, Great Britain, was a frequent target of Viking raids. Vikings raided England, Wales, and the continent from their bases in Ireland and Scotland. In fact, in the 5th century, the patron saint of Ireland, St. Patrick, who was a Christian missionary, was captured and enslaved by Irish pirates. The Middle Ages, especially the first few centuries, were also a period of intense piracy around Europe. The most widely known pirates in medieval Europe are obviously the Vikings, who raided half of Europe from their bases in Scandinavia between the 8th and the 12th centuries. The first Viking raids were reported in the 8th century in Britain, and then they only intensified for decades. They reached regions as far from Scandinavia as the south of Spain and even Italy. Almost all coastal areas from Russia to North Africa were attacked at some point. Vikings terrorized large parts of Europe for centuries. They occasionally attacked trade ships 
but more often they targeted towns or even cities on the coasts. Wherever they were close to a coast, they raided and sometimes even destroyed these settlements before disappearing with their loot. The reason why piracy was so common in the early Middle Ages is that they weren't any real centralized powers that could fight back to protect sea lanes. Over time, feudal kingdoms that were a bit more centralized and more prosperous appeared, and they could create their own navies, defend their coasts, and repel, or at least discourage the pirates. But Vikings weren't the only pirates threatening Europe. Muslim pirates also attacked ships and ports all around the Mediterranean. It was, in large part, to counter these pirates and to protect their ships that Italian cities like Venice and Genoa developed their own war fleets, as did cities in the Hanseatic League. From the 12th century onward, the Hanseatic League lay in the Baltic Sea. This was a confederation of towns and guilds that started in the north of Germany. To be clear, they did not form a state. They all remained independent, but they had defensive and trade agreements between them to protect their interests, or more precisely, the interests of their merchants who traded all sorts of goods around the Baltic Sea, the North Sea, and inland on the continent. The League grew and expanded up until the 15th century and came to include Poland, the Baltic States, Russia, and the Netherlands. The volume of goods they exchanged also grew, and so these trade ships in the north of Europe attracted pirates, who had many places to hide around the Baltic Sea. Famous pirates of this era included the Victual Brothers of the island of Gotland. Victual Brothers were a guild, a collective of privateers who attacked ships on behalf of the government. They were like mercenaries of the seas. But later, when their privateering activity declined, they turned to piracy, which meant doing the same thing, but this time working only for themselves and keeping all the profits. Maritime trade in the Baltic Sea suffered from their depredations for years, and in fact, almost collapsed at some point until their island was invaded by the Teutonic Order at the end of the 14th century. Generally, from the end of the Middle Ages, more powerful centralized states emerged. Piracy activity in Europe tended to decline. There were fewer places for them to hide between the raids, and piracy was increasingly being replaced with privateering. Kingdoms tolerated these pirates-turned-mercenaries because they advanced a kingdom's own war effort. From the 15th and 16th centuries, countries like England or France started to enable privateers working for them. Very often against the wealthy colonial powers of Spain and Portugal, whose ships were bringing back to Europe unthinkable treasures from Asia and America. Gold, silver, gems, and all sorts of spices and precious fabrics. But the most active were the Barbary Corsairs, or Rutrees, and Hyredine Barbarossa privateers, and sometimes pirates close to Europe. From this period were the so-called Barbary pirates, or Barbary corsairs, 
based in North Africa and operating with the approval of the Ottoman Empire. What was this about? From the 15th century, the Ottoman Empire began to expand dramatically and in every direction from its initial territories in Turkey and the Balkans. They created an empire even bigger than Byzantium. They conquered half of the Balkans, all of Turkey, the Levant, Egypt, and many islands in the Mediterranean and westwards. Here, Ottomans expanded into North Africa. These North African provinces were very far from the capital, Istanbul, and they had a higher degree of autonomy. Today, this area corresponds to the countries of Libya, Tunisia, and Algeria. Ottoman influence also reached parts of Morocco, even though Morocco never became an Ottoman province. As I said before, there had already been a tradition of Muslim piracy in the Mediterranean for centuries. But from the 16th century, once Ottoman influence in North Africa was established, it took on much bigger proportions. There were several reasons for the success of piracy in the region. One, because the North African coast guaranteed a safe haven. Two, because the Ottoman Empire was a reliable customer, purchasing and enslaving anyone these privateers captured. And three, because pirates or outcasts from other parts of Europe or the Mediterranean established this region as their base. For example, a famous Barbary Corsair operating out of Algiers was the English pirate John Ward. Later known as Yusuf Race, Simon Danziger, a Dutchman, and other corsairs appearing out of Tripoli captured more than 40 ships during Danziger's career. But the most famous Barbary corsair were the Barbarossa brothers. They both were born in the island of Lesbos in the Aegean Sea, which is part of Greece today. Not only did the brothers have brilliant careers as corsairs, they later became commanders of the Ottoman navy. The elder brother was called Ulrich Race, and he started his career as a privateer at the end of the 15th century in the Levant, operating between Turkey, Syria, and Egypt. But he was captured by the Christian Knights Hospitaller and kept prisoner for nearly three years. The Knights Hospitallers owned the island of Rhodes, off the east coast of Turkey. From the island, they inflicted damage on Ottoman shipping and trade. Orich Race was able to escape from jail with the help of his younger brother, we'll talk about him later, and was given a fleet of galleys to attack Knight's ships. In the following years, he participated in raids in other parts of the Mediterranean, always with bigger and bigger fleets, lent to him by the Ottomans. In 1503, he installed his base on the island of Jerba in Tunisia and was joined by his younger brother. At this time, Tunisia was not yet an Ottoman province, but it had a sultan. The sultan agreed to let the brothers use its main port, La Goulette, in return for one-third of their booty. From there, the two brothers attacked Italian ships and raided the coasts for victims to sell into slavery. They were joined by other corsairs, 
and Tunisia became a major privateer base in the Mediterranean. In the following years, he earned a lot of respect in the Muslim world for transporting Muslims who still lived in Spain to regions that were safer for them. You may not know that in the 15th century, the monarchs of Spain, Ferdinand II and Isabella I, also known as the Catholic monarchs, finished the Reconquista, the reconquest of Iberian Peninsula, destroying the Muslim Sultanate that had flourished in the south of Spain during the Middle Ages. Their reconquest finished at the same time that Christopher Columbus discovered the route to Americas for the Spanish crown, paving the way for Spanish expansion overseas. The reconquest was not just territorial, it was also religious. After it was finished, religious minorities like Jews and Muslims were required to convert to Christianity. Some accepted, some pretended to accept, and yet others emigrated. But years after the end of their reconquest, there were still many Muslim communities in Spain that did not accept demands to abandon their faith. Ulrich Dreis transported thousands of them to North Africa on his ships in the 15th and 16th centuries. The two brothers, acting together, took control of Algiers and now constantly fought against Spain, which was becoming the dominant power in the western Mediterranean. Oruk Rish had proclaimed himself the new sultan of Algiers, and he decided to join the Ottoman Empire for protection because it was Spain's main rival and his homeland. He became the governor and, with the Ottoman support, he tried to expel the Spanish from North Africa, where they were trying to establish territory. He was killed in 1518 in the city of Lemsen, that's west of Algeria today, during a battle against Spain, and his title and responsibilities went to his younger brother, Hizir Reis, also known as Hiradin Pasha. Hizir continued his brother's work with reinforcements sent by the Ottomans. He defeated Spanish armies in Algeria and once again raided the coasts of Spain, France, and Italy. He even captured several ships returning from the New World. In 1522, after years of battle on the seas, he was the most distinguished sea commander in the entire Ottoman Empire and was appointed Grand Admiral of the Ottoman Navy. As the Grand Admiral, Hizir Rees led big fleets and attacks against Italy and the possession of the Republic of Venice around Greece. These were the years when Ottoman power in the Mediterranean looked almost unstoppable. The Ottoman Empire was invincible, whether on land or at sea. The peak of its maritime career was in 1538, when the fleet he commanded defeated a combined fleet of Italian states and Spain. After several more years of expeditions, he finally retired in 1545 in Istanbul, awash with honors. He died the following year at the age of 68. In the end, he lived a quiet life and was one of the few privateers I will tell you about who lived a long life and died naturally. 
So the Barbary Corsairs remained active well after the two Barbarossa brothers, almost until the 19th century, and remained a major threat to all merchant ships entering the Mediterranean through the Strait of Gibraltar. After the decline of the Ottoman Empire, Barbary privateers still found new recruits and new causes. They were encouraged by France to attack the Spanish, and later by Holland and Britain to attack France, until the Vienna Congress in 1814, when European nations united to eliminate the threat. Barbary pirates disappeared completely in 1830, when France began its invasion of Algeria. While Barbary pirates terrorized Europe, another place of intense pirate activity was East Asia. The continent had already been known for pirate activity for centuries, if not thousands of years particularly in the coastal regions of China. There are records of piracy in the Yellow Sea, north of China, from the 9th century. During the 13th century, pirates based in Japan raided and looted coastal areas in China, and this activity intensified under the Ming Dynasty. The Ming Dynasty ruled over China for almost 300 years, from 1368 to 1644. During their reign, private sea trade was prohibited, and all trade was fully controlled or operated by the state. However, many smugglers appeared and tried to circumvent the rules occasionally turning into pirates. What we might call the golden age of Chinese piracy occurred during the following dynasty, the Qing dynasty, which ruled from 1644 to 1911. Over the course of two and a half centuries, there were ups and downs, but in general, the Chinese state became increasingly weak, technologically backward, and unable to defend itself from the appetites of its neighbors, including Japan and European powers. In the 18th century, Chinese pirate fleets grew in size and power to such an extent that they controlled villages on the coast and could raise their own taxes. They operated more like warlords, in fact, and they preyed enormously on maritime trade between Chinese provinces, especially provinces in the south, like Guangdong. Pirates might have peaked at the beginning of the 19th century. Two prominent figures of this era are Zheng Yi, and even more so his wife, Zheng Yi Sao, also known as Qing Shi. Zheng Ji was born in Guangdong in 1765 to a family of pirates. This had been their profession for several generations already. He learned navigation and combat from a young age, and using his charisma, he brought a coalition of pirate fleets under his command. By 1804, his fleet was absolutely huge. It comprised more than 10,000 men, his own little private army. Zheng Yi died in 1807, but his wife inherited the entire fleet which consisted, at some point, of over 300 junks, manned by more than 20,000 men. At this point, it would have been enough to attack the Qing's navy. Qing Shi's origins are not precisely known, just that she was born in 1775 and became a prostitute in Guangzhou, 
She worked on a floating brothel, or possibly owned it, and the reasons for her marriage to Zheng Ji are unclear. Either he fell in love with her, or it was a business move because, in her line of work, she could collect valuable intelligence that could be useful to pirates. When her husband died prematurely, he was just 39, Ching Shi moved immediately to secure her leadership position by cultivating personal relationships with several rivals and by securing the support of members of her husband's family. To consolidate her fleet, she issued her own code of conduct that all pirates in the fleet had to observe, and she imposed her rule on the coast of China, from Macau to Canton. Villages on the coast were, in fact, controlled and taxed by her organization, and she attacked towns and seized ships from the government or other pirates who navigated into what she considered to be her waters. In 1808, the Chinese government tried to destroy her fleet in a series of battles, but lost. And Ching Shi went on to defeat several other pirates that same year. Her rule lasted until 1809, when her fleet was devastated by the Portuguese navy. The problem was that the Chinese junks at this point were no match for European warships. And in 1810, she had to accept the amnesty offer from the Qing government. She was allowed to keep her wealth and to establish herself as a businesswoman. She opened a gambling house that she later moved to Macau. Along with her brother, she got involved in the salt trade. Qing Shi died peacefully at her bed decades later in 1844. But after Ching Shi, Chinese pirates started to decline, a decline that accelerated the 19th century as foreign powers like Britain and the United States campaigned against the Chinese pirates as their own trades were affected. These fleets of pirate junks ceased to exist by the 1870s. At about the same time, Another form of piracy disappeared in Southeast Asia, in the area that today corresponds to Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. In this region, the pirate profession was ancient and had thrived long before the arrival of Europeans. Southeast Asia has thousands of islands and trade routes that go through narrow passages like the Straits of Malacca. Further west, in the Indian Ocean or the Persian Gulf, piracy was progressively eradicated in the 19th century. But one era and region of the world that shaped most of our imagery of pirates, at least in the west, is the Caribbean in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. So what happened in the Caribbean for such activity to flourish for so long? As mentioned before, the first Europeans to be present in the Caribbean were Spanish ships when Columbus reached the Americas at the end of the 15th century. Most islands in the Caribbean are relatively small, though some are bigger, like Cuba, Hispaniola, Jamaica, or Puerto Rico. The Spanish explored and named the majority of the islands, but didn't really colonize or exploit them, instead focusing their colonization efforts much more on the American mainlands. Starting with Mexico in the year 1520, and then South America, where they invaded the Inca Empire, in 1560. 
These conquests were, at the time, much more profitable than the foundation of colonies in the Caribbean islands. Spanish conquerors confiscated incredible amounts of gold and silver as they attacked mines in Mexico, like the mines of Zacatecas, and further south in Bolivia, the mines of Potosí, which produced more precious metals than any other known mines in the world at that time. Even more than gold, silver was a precious metal produced in abundance in this new world. Later, a colonial economy based on the production of crops and exotic goods like sugar and tobacco, cocoa, dyes, or cotton appeared, and plantations were created in the New World. But this didn't start immediately in the 16th century. Spanish possessions in the Americas generated so much wealth that there was little interest in creating an economy based on plantation production and goods exportation. We're not talking about a few chests of gold sent to Spain every year. These were literally hundreds and hundreds of tons of precious metals and stones that were sent routinely. By the middle of the 16th century, the Kingdom of Spain had more income than any other European country had ever had. But for the most part, this treasure didn't stay long in Spain. As the country was constantly at war against France, England, and the Ottomans, it had other regions in revolt like the Netherlands. So all of its resources, and then some, were spent on armies, ships, and even food. As the country's population decreased due to immigration to the colonies, making farm labor scarce. At the end of the day, gold from the Americas benefited not only Spain, but also the entirety of Western Europe, thanks to these continuous conflicts. The Spanish crown was frequently bankrupted due to spending more than it received. To repatriate their plundered riches, the Spanish sent ships from the Americas to Seville, in the south of Spain. These ships, loaded with treasures, were tempting prey for pirates. The first attacks on these ships occurred in the first half of the 16th century by French pirates, either in the Caribbean, near the point of departure, or near Seville, where the ships arrived from Spain. And since Spain was at war or had been close to war for a good part of the 16th century, the French crown sanctioned these attacks and commissioned privateers to attack Spanish ships. To counter the threats, the Spanish organized a system of convoys and created a fleet to transport their treasures. Once a year, for more than two centuries, a fleet sailed annually from Seville to New Spain in America, generally to Panama or to Veracruz in Mexico. The convoy brought passengers, groups, and manufactured goods from Europe. They loaded up with the products of taxation and huge quantities of silver before sailing back to Spain. This system was quite efficient, and the entire convoy was never attacked because it would have required a fleet that no pirates or privateers had available. However, pirate ships sometimes followed the convoy in the hope that, like a weak animal falling behind its herd, a ship or two would lose sight of the convoy or be separated from it by a storm. The treasure fleet didn't end piracy in the Caribbean or the Atlantic Ocean because, at the same time, new countries, primary France, England, and the Netherlands, 
started to be interested in colonization of the Americas. I mentioned earlier that the Caribbean islands had remained rather empty, despite being claimed by Spain. The Spanish created important colony ports in Cuba and Hispaniola, but the rest remained mostly unoccupied. But by the end of the 16th century, Europeans realized that the production of crops like sugar or tobacco could be as profitable, if not more, in the long run than the mere extraction of gold and silver. It is during this period that an economy centered around the Atlantic Ocean appeared. New plantations in the Americas required a workforce that the native population in the Caribbean could not fulfill. Native populations were rapidly decimated due to diseases and the cruel demands of slavery under the rule of the European colonists. The new source of slave labor would instead be Africa. Ships would sail from Europe to Africa to kidnap or purchase Africans there, transport them to the Caribbean to be enslaved, then return to Europe loaded with valuable goods that were in high demand during the 17th and 18th centuries. Trade flow in the Atlantic Ocean exploded. Instead of having a few dozen ships making the trip as happened in the years following Columbus's exploration, there were now hundreds of them, generally carrying valuable cargo. At the beginning of the 17th century, Spain also became unable to prevent other European nations from setting foot in the Caribbean and creating their own colonies. Europe, especially during the Thirty Years' War, was consuming all its resources. This was a moment when successful colonies were founded by the English, like in Barbados or Jamaica, by the French in the west of Hispaniola, now Haiti, or Martinique or by the Dutch at Curaçao. These nations were often at war with Spain and were happy to let privateers use their bases in the Caribbean to attack Spanish ships and outposts. Among these bases, Tortuga, off the coast of Haiti, which had been fortified, served as a safe haven for smugglers, privateers, and outright pirates who worked only for themselves. At some point, decades later, Tortuga almost became an independent pirate republic. But I'll come back to that later. So this is the background in the Caribbean at the beginning of the Golden Age of Caribbean piracy. Around the middle of the 17th century, the region was growing wealthier thanks to the success of sugar plantations. There was an intense flow of trade between the islands from Africa and towards Europe. Literally hundreds of ships, big and small, sailed in the region. There were different powers with conflicting interests. Hundreds of small and large islands where it was possible to hide and a very cosmopolitan population, people from all over Europe, Africans, new immigrants, and Creoles, the offspring of these immigrants born in America. A lot of seamen were experienced in navigation and in combat because they had fought in Europe before arriving in the Caribbean. Add to this fact, in the second half of the 17th century, the major powers in Europe were almost constantly at war with each other or engaged in civil war. There were several wars due to commercial rivalries, wars between the French and the Dutch, and then coalitions including the Dutch and the English against the French under Louis XIV. None of these colonial powers were in a position to police the Caribbean and reign in piracy. 
So pirates naturally thrived in this environment. Pirates in the Caribbean also developed a number of peculiarities like a form of democracy on their ships and specific codes of conduct. Now let's take a look at some of the famous figures from this era. There are many, but I'm going to focus on three of them. John Fleury, Blackbeard, and Henry Morgan. John Fleury is from the early age of Atlantic piracy. He is best known for the capture of Spanish galleons that carried the Aztec treasure of Hernán Cortés from Mexico to Spain. His date of birth is unknown, but he served as a ship's pilot and then commander of a small squadron. During the wars of Italy at the beginning of the 16th century, in Portugal, on the last leg of their journey to Spain from Mexico, and likely unbeknownst to Jean Fleury, these galleons were loaded with the treasure seized in Mexico by Cortes and sent back as a tribute to the King of Spain. Fleury captured them, and on the trip back to France, he assaulted another ship returning from Santo Domingo. This was before the Spanish created their convoy system. And the treasure Fleury brought back and presented to the King of France was spectacular, including tons of gold, emeralds, pearls, jade, and numerous Aztec works of art, like masks and ornaments. This capture was what made French aware of the kind of wealth the Spanish had found in America. The following year, Fleury captured over 30 Portuguese and Spanish ships. However, he was later captured and hanged in Spain. Another famous pirate, this time from the golden age of piracy in the Caribbean, was Blackbeard. He was born in 1680 in Britain and was probably raised in Bristol, maybe in a relatively wealthy family, because he was known to be educated or could at least read and write. He may have arrived in the Caribbean in his late teens, maybe on a slave ship, because Bristol was a major seaport for the Atlantic slave trade back then. Blackbeard probably lived as a member of a privateer crew for years, but at some point he moved to the islands of New Providence in the Bahamas. New Providence had become a haven for pirates because it had a natural harbor that could accommodate hundreds of small ships while at the same time being too shallow for larger navies. New Providence was also positioned at the entrance of the Florida Strait, a busy route that European ships used to sail back to Europe, like Tortuga, New Providence had turned into a safe haven for pirates, with a small permanent population, as well as a fluctuating population of pirates seeking respite and shelter. Spending some time with their loot and recruiting crew members. In 1715, the big war in Europe, the War of the Spanish Succession, ended and many privateers turned pirates now that their illegal activities were no longer government-sanctioned. Blackbeard began his career as a pirate with small attacks, capturing cargoes of flour or wine. In 1717, he reappeared in charge of a small squadron of three ships. One was a large slave ship that he had captured and converted for this purpose, renaming it Queen Anne's Revenge. The ship was equipped with 40 guns, which was a lot at the time and very powerful for a pirate ship. 
This gave him the ability to attack large, armed merchant ships. At this point, he had at least 150 men working for him, split among the three vessels, and Blackbeard and his crew continued to attack and seize bigger and bigger prizes. He reached the height of his power in 1718, when he used Queen Anne's revenge for more spectacular actions, like a blockade of the Charlestown, now Charleston, in the province of South Carolina. Blackbeard was quickly becoming a celebrity, and this was the point at which his nickname Blackbeard first appeared, due to his long, thick beard. He was reported to terrify his enemies by putting lit matches soaked in gunpowder under his hat. The effect made it look like smoke poured from his head like a demon. However, Blackbeard's career was relatively short-lived. He was captured and killed after a ferocious battle in November of 1718. Despite his exploits and fearsome appearance, Blackbeard was romanticized after his death. His image has been heavily depicted in fictional evil pirates like Captain Hook and others. However, there is no record of him ever actually harming or murdering his captives. And he always commanded with the consent of his crews. Another pirate, or more precisely a privateer, who caused much more destruction and had a longer-lasting impact than Blackbeard, was Henry Morgan. Fifty years before Blackbeard, Morgan who was Welsh, made his way into the West Indies, though it is unknown exactly how. What we do know is that he befriended two British governors of Jamaica in the 1660s, and the governor gave him a license to attack Spanish vessels. In 1667, when relations between England and Spain deteriorated again. Morgan distinguished himself by conducting successful raids on Cuba, Panama, and around Maracaibo, now Venezuela. He destroyed a large Spanish squadron in 1671 and attacked Panama City. The city was not on the Caribbean coast, but on the Pacific on the other side of the Isthmus of Panama. The narrow stretch of land now bisected by the Panama Canal. Morgan managed to take the city completely off guard by having his men cross the Isthmus. After that, to appease the Spanish, who had recently signed a peace treaty with England, Morgan was arrested and sent to London. Far from being punished in his home country, he was fated as a hero and sent back to Jamaica to serve as a lieutenant governor. He stayed there until his death in 1688. Morgan was unique as one of the few pirate figures to inspire fiction in the 19th and 20th centuries, and he was truly successful, highly successful in his return to civilian life. Morgan lived out his final years on an enormous sugar plantation in Jamaica before dying, respected and rich, of either tuberculosis or cirrhosis of the liver. These are just some well-known pirates active in the Caribbean. During piracy's heyday, there were many others of note, such as Edward Lowe, Charles Vane, Françoise Leclerc, and Anne Bartholomew Roberts. The vast majority were male, but there were a few female pirates, and occasionally in a commanding position, such as Anne Bonny or Mary Reed. The world of pirates obviously existed outside the law. 
but with such a broad scope and the long duration of pirate activity in parts of the world. Pirates also established their own places, codes, and rules. I told you earlier about the pirate base in New Providence in the Bahamas. There were other, similar places away from the jurisdiction or control of any government. One such place was the island of Toga, off the coast of Australia, where for a short time almost a pirate republic existed. Nowadays we can easily have a romanticized vision of pirates, but to their contemporaries they were just seen and depicted as disgusting criminals, and that's understandable. If we consider the one region in the world where there is still significant piracy, the Horn of Africa, especially off the coast of Somalia. Nobody would present those pirates as romantic heroes. Because it's happening right now. What they do is revolting to us, and that's exactly how people felt from the 17th and 18th centuries about pirates. These Caribbean pirates were criminals, but it doesn't mean they had no rules especially on board their vessels. People became pirates voluntarily. Sometimes it was a life they chose, other times it was a lesser evil. For example, for escaped slaves, piracy was sometimes the only way for them to live as free men. Also, there were no known racial divisions on board of ships. There were, however, explicit rules. There was generally a dress code. Women were forbidden on some ships. Smoking was also forbidden, but not for health reasons, but because it was dangerous. Wooden ships and fire just don't mix. Rules could be discussed before departure between crew members, and there was a vote conducted. So it was a very democratic culture. Also, prior to departure, an agreement was discussed and signed that determined what percentage of profits each crew member would receive. Typically, the captain would get five or six shares of the wealth. Senior members of the crew, two shares. Regular crew members, one share. And beginning or juniors, first-time pirates or teenagers, half a share. This was not perfect equality, and it reflected responsibilities and experience, but still. Captain got only ten times more than a kid, and five times more than a crew member. Which was much more egalitarian than the societies from which they came. Apart from the life of adventures and easy profits, Sometimes the pirate life must have been very attractive for poor European immigrants or escaped slaves, and it explains why thousands and thousands of men chose this life all the time. But like in other parts of the world, the particular situation that led to so much piracy in the Caribbean finally came to an end. After the reign of Louis XIV and his last big war, the war of succession of Spain, the situation in Western Europe, became much more peaceful and remained so for several decades until the Seven Years' War. European powers returned to develop their colonies in the Americas, and they could now send much bigger fleets to secure the region especially the British Royal Navy. They turned against pirates and progressively eliminated their bases. Some of the pirate crews emigrated to the Indian Ocean around Madagascar, where they hoped to find new opportunities. This region was another major shipping lane. As all sea trades between Asia and Europe had to pass by the Cape of Good Hope, in the south of Africa. 
Pirates in this area intercepted ships going to or returning from India, Indonesia, China, or Japan. This worked for a time, but by the end of the 18th century, Western piracy in this form had completely disappeared. With the ongoing growth of navies in the 19th century, piracy around the world declined even further. While it never entirely disappeared, it remained on a very small scale compared to what it used to be in world history. In recent years, piracy has been reported off the coast of Somalia, the coast of Venezuela in the Caribbean, the Gulf of Guinea, and the Strait of Malacca. These attacks are a serious concern for the safety of maritime trade. Although they cannot disrupt it as much as they did in past centuries in the Mediterranean, the Sea of China, or the Caribbean. We've come to the end of our little journey tonight. I hope you enjoyed this adventure, and I invite you to discover and learn more. Now you can let go and sleep. Or you can pick another story from my library. And until we meet again, good night, sleep well.